Good Yantif. So this is my third high holidays as one of your rabbis, and I must say that I cannot imagine a greater honor in my lifetime. I remember two years back how terrified I was. I was such a young man. <laughs> I didn't have a single gray hair on my head, and now I stand before you with all four of my gray hairs. And as my sixth graders described me last week, a seasoned veteran middle-aged rabbi, <laughs> I certainly hope not, but I remember also a couple of years ago, after the high holidays, having been a rabbi for a full 10 weeks, calling my family after the services and saying, it's so great, it was amazing, I know that a lot of rabbis have their critics and people who don't like them, but everyone loves me. I'm going to be the first rabbi in the history of rabbis who everyone likes. <laughs> to which all of my family and friends gave me the tremendously supportive feedback of, well, that's just because they don't know you well enough yet. <laughs> Give it some time. Now that I've given you all a bit of time to get to know me a bit better, I can say they were right. <laughs> While I know that for many of you, I'm in your good graces. I've had more than a couple of people who've told me that I'm not quite their cup of tea. But the reason why, though, has usually been because I've said something relating to the political atmosphere in our country or in Israel that they did not agree with. I come to synagogue not to hear about politics but to feel good. I've heard that and also I've gotten the feedback, a rabbi should never talk about politics. Even my highly esteemed colleague, whom I deeply respect, Rabbi David Wolpe from the other side of the hill, wrote in the Jewish journal that it is not the place of the rabbi to talk about such things, writing, all day long, all we hear is politics. Can we not come to shul for something different, something deeper? I want to know what my rabbi thinks of Jacob and Rachel, not of Pence and Pelosi. Well, after Rabbi Wolpe wrote this article, I heard even more, see, even the great Rabbi Wolpe says it's not your job to speak about such things. Yet, despite what he wrote, even Rabbi Wolpe has found that it is his, that it is his duty as a rabbi to at times speak out. For this reason, the same Rabbi Wolpe who said we shouldn't talk about politics wrote an article in Time magazine called The Iranian Deal is a Win for Anti-Semitism and has given sermons such as Ki Tetze, Should They Build the Islamic Center Near Ground Zero? And just last month after his article came out, Re'e, Torah, Truth, and Trump as a response to Charlottesville. Now last year, the President of the United States was President Barack Obama, a man whom I deeply respect but with whom I have disagreements. When he came out in favor of marriage equality, I applauded him and pointed to how his decision reflected the Jewish values that I find in the Torah. However, last December, in one of his last acts as president, President Obama chose not to veto a United Nations resolution that unilaterally slammed Israel, allowing the resolution to pass and isolating Israel on the world stage. I was livid and spoke out of how the Torah teaches us how to appropriately handle disputes with those whom we love and how it goes against our values to publicly humiliate and isolate our friends. Similarly, I spoke openly on how I felt that Keith Ellison's statements on Israel disqualified him from leadership in the Democratic Party. From the right wing in our community, I was applauded for my courage, for my speaking out on Jewish values, and for my standing up for Israel. While from the left wing in our community, I got some pretty unhappy emails saying that I should not talk politics from the Bema. Now fast forward a month, and we got ourselves a new president, Donald Trump. From President Trump's response to Charlottesville, transgender military personnel, immigration ban, withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, and planned repeal of DACA, 
I have found my Jewish values frequently opposed to the decisions of the president and have been outspoken about those differences. The feedback that I got was that many of those same liberals who told me that I should never talk about politics applauded my bravery and speaking out, and many of those same conservatives who applauded me six months earlier angrily told me that I should never talk about politics from the pulpit. <laughs> I have also had people write on my Facebook that I should never speak of politics, and then within 24 hours applauded my colleague for posting a different opinion on the same issue than my own. When I have spoken from the Bema, I've been told, do not talk about politics from the Bema. When I have tried to tie modern issues into classes that I teach, I've been told, keep your views out of the synagogue. And when I have expressed my views on my personal Facebook and am not in the synagogue, I have been told to censor myself. No joke, last year during the campaign, I gave a sermon and was told afterwards that it was inappropriate for me to bring up female biblical characters because this was clearly a subliminal endorsement for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> that really happened. I'm not alone in this experience. As rabbis around the country have had their jobs threatened, have been slandered, been accused of taking money from left-wing organizations, and... For my right-wing colleagues, they've been harassed when it's discovered that they voted for President Trump. There is a fear and a feeling that there is no place for us to teach our Jewish values as they relate to the societal issues in our private or public lives. Interestingly, I haven't yet received one email. I have not received a single email or phone call saying, Rabbi, I agreed with everything you said, but I wish you would not talk about pol political matters. Which leads me to a conclusion that people do not necessarily have a problem with hearing about political issues of the day, but rather they do not like to hear viewpoints that oppose their own. So on this Yom Kippur, I'm going to give you a sermon about the history of sermons. <laughs> Originally, rabbis did not give sermons. Now before you get too nostalgic, let me tell you what they did do. Rabbis would sit and argue with their students on matters of the day and how they related to the Torah. Later on in organized services, not the rabbi, but rather a professional sermonizer would go from town to town giving sermons at services. Often this person did not know much about Torah or Jewish law, but instead was able to relate Jewish values to the issues facing the Jewish community of that place and time. In the 18th and 19th centuries is when we first began to see the creation of the modern rabbinic sermon. Synagogue goers who had been exposed in the Muslim world to Friday sermons by imams and on Sundays by preachers in the Christian world. In these sermons, the religious leaders taught ancient texts, not as heirlooms, but rather as living fountains for helping provide a connection between times of old and contemporary issues. These ideals inspired the creation of the reform movement, first in Germany and then in America around this same time. The religious texts that, we, that became the centerpiece of our movement were from the prophets, who saw as their job the mission to spread often unpopular messages that criticized the government and society when they felt that they strayed from the moral values of the Torah. Though our tradition teaches that since the destruction of the temple, there have been no actual prophets. The reform movement decided to take this idea and spread a prophetic message through biblical interpretations. As a result of this vision for what modern Judaism should be, the movement began to find itself forced to confront controversial issues. A notable first one was during the Civil War. The man often credited with founding the reform movement in America, Rabbi David Einhorn, preached how the Torah spoke of the horrors of slavery we suffered in Egypt and how every person was created in God's image, and therefore it was incumbent upon us as Jews to oppose slavery and support abolition. His contemporary, Rabbi M.J. Rafal of New York City, gave a very different sermon stating how Judaism could not be opposed to slavery when the Torah gives numerous examples of how to treat one's slaves and that owning slaves has been a part of the history of the Jewish people since our exodus from Egypt. Fast forward to the first half of the 20th century. 
Rabbis where I was ordained at the Hebrew Union College were generally vehemently anti-Zionist. Professors and students who spoke out in favor of Zionism were dismissed from the institution. One of the students who was challenged but managed to graduate was a guy, I shouldn't even say his name, you've never heard of him, Stephen S. Wise. And Wise saw the lack of freedom of speech and ability to have discourse as a problem, not only at Hebrew Union College, but after he was fired from his first job as a rabbi for speaking about Zionism. And so he went on to found his own rabbinical school in New York, the Jewish Institute of Religion. The first two honorary doctorates that Wise bestowed on behalf of his seminary were to Chaim Bialik, the Hebrew Renaissance poet and staunch Zionist, and Claude Montefiore, the leader of liberal Judaism in Britain and an ardent anti-Zionist. Wise sent the message to his students that regardless of where you fall on the issue of Zionism, you deserve freedom in your pulpit without fear of losing your job. But on this issue of such great importance, you must not remain silent. You must take a stand. As a result of Wise's efforts, Zionism became one of the most heavily debated and discussed items from the pulpit, despite many people saying that such a divisive political topic was inappropriate to talk about in a synagogue. These sermons ultimately solidified the support of most American Jews for the creation of the Jewish state. Less than two decades later, in the midst of the Holocaust and the decimation of Europe's Jews, Wise would advocate that American Jews should not encourage American intervention in Europe. He argued that American Jewish advocacy would create more anti-Semitism in the United States by pressuring President Roosevelt. Instead, it would be better for the Jewish people if we were silent on the issue of the Holocaust. 400 other rabbis who disagreed with Wise left often at the protest of their congregants. They left their synagogues and they marched to Washington, D.C. and demanded a meeting with the president to insist that he do more to help the Jewish people. And going on to the 1950s, we faced the issue of segregation. The majority of Southern Jews did not speak out on this issue, not wanting to face the scorn of their white Christian neighbors. One Alabama rabbi said that he would not risk one hair on the head of one of his congregants to save all the lives of the black people of his state. And Martin Luther King wrote, the national Jewish bodies have been most helpful, but local Jewish leadership has been silent. Montgomery Jews want to bury their heads and repeat that it is not a Jewish problem. I want to go on record and agree that it is not a Jewish problem, but it is a fight between the forces of justice and injustice. I want them to join with us on the side of justice. One reform rabbi in Birmingham, Milton Grafman, who actually opposed segregation, wrote a public letter criticizing King's protests as disruptive and inappropriate. We can find in the Torah including the prohibition on wearing two different types of fabrics, evidence of support for views on segregation. Those in favor of integration, they pointed to examples of Jewish segregation as a part of our narrative, and that the Torah says that every person was created in God's image and likeness as evidence that we have a Jewish duty to treat others with equality. Some, some southern rabbis spoke out in favor of segregation, Others went to their state capitals and fought segregation bills and spoke passionately from their pulpits on the issue of desegregation. Rabbi Jacob Rothschild, a young rabbi at the temple in Atlanta, gave many sermons on the issue, typically tying his sermons to the prophets and the Torah. And during his 1948 High Holiday Sermon, he preached, We the Jews must do more than view with alarm the growing race hatred that threatens the South. The problem is ours to solve, and the time for solution is now. We have committed no overt sin in our dealings with the black community. I feel certain that we have treated them fairly. Certainly, we have not used force to frighten them. We have even felt a certain sympathy for their predicament. No, our sin has been the deeper one the evil of what we didn't do. Rothschild's congregants were irate and said that he should never talk of political issues from the pulpit, but they were there instead to hear Torah. In 1958, his synagogue was bombed for his outspokenness on the issue. 
When we look back on these issues with history on our side, we can make the following judgments. Those who were against slavery, for Zionism, for intervention during World War II, and those who were opposed to segregation were morally right. Those who supported slavery, opposed Zionism, opposed World War II intervention, and supported segregation, they were morally wrong. But also, those who were too frightened to speak out because it was not their problem or because they did not want to upset their congregants did their communities and the world a disservice. What they called politics was actually Torah. And I will say this, both the rabbis who were in the right and those who were in the wrong both fulfilled the words of Pirkei Avot, which say, in a place where there is no moral courage, strive to be courageous. Even those who were morally wrong at least took the chance by speaking out on this issue as opposed to the rabbis who did their congregants and their rabbinate a disservice by remaining quiet and being cowards. My friends, it is very possible that history will judge me wrong for some of my views, and I do fear that. However, can any of us really say that on the issues of slavery, Zionism, Holocaust intervention, and segregation that these rabbis should have remained silent? So what do we do from here in a time where there's so much history and change in our world? Have the conversation. Do not silence it. Listen to the other in your community and have the humility to know that you might be wrong. I myself learned this lesson as in college when I was the head of the pro-Israel group, I refused to include J Street in our group. Anyone who disagreed with my views and my approach on Israel was clearly anti-Israel and wrong. This past year, I went to the J Street Conference, and I must tell you, it was the best conference I've ever been to. Why? Because rather than spending my time and money to go to a place where I would just hear people agree with my own opinions, I found myself challenged. I found some of my views solidified. I found agreement with people whom I thought I did not have any. And most importantly, I heard their narratives. I heard that people came to viewpoints different than my own through their experiences, their studies, and their strong love of Israel that we share. I got to learn from others and grow in my connections with them despite us disagreeing on certain points. We read in the Talmud of how Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai disagreed with each other over virtually everything and were the other's fiercest critic. However, we read too that the two of them loved and trusted one another more than anybody else in the world. They valued their differences, for as Pirkei Avot also asks, who is wise, and it answers, the one who can learn from every person. It is incumbent upon us to be the Hillels and Shammais of our time and learn from one another. Shutting down discourse because we disagree with each other is a complete affront to our rich tradition of being Am Yisrael, the people who struggle with God and each other. And since the beginning days of the Reform Movement, we have asserted that Judaism should not be an heirloom, but rather a living fountain that confronts the challenges of the world through the study of Torah. Our synagogues have been and should always be places of intellectual debate, community organizing, and justice, where the great ideas will be born that will change our nation and the world. In fact, the Talmud requires that our prayer spaces have windows. And why is that? It's because when we pray and study, we must not isolate ourselves, but rather we must look out at the world and its challenges. Sadly, surveys have shown that liberal rabbis as well as right-wing congregants have felt increasingly fearful of sharing their points of view and Jewish values in the synagogue, which are their Jewish homes. Censoring ourselves and each other does not create a safe, unified community. Instead, let us remember another Jewish teaching, that when two people argue for the sake of Torah, the divine presence sits between them. So when I or somebody else here says something that you do not like or disagree with, do not threaten to quit the synagogue. Do not smile at us in the hallways and badmouth us behind our backs. And do not tell us to censor ourselves. But rather, what I want you to do is gather your like-minded friends, call me, make an appointment, come to my office, and be my rabbi. Take your Torah, open it up, and point to your Jewish values and tell me why your Judaism disagrees with mine. 
when we dialogue in this way, we can understand that the other person's views are Jewish values. We can learn from one another, and we can have a Jewish community that does not walk on eggshells around each other. Rather, we will grow in our mutual understanding, in our knowledge of Torah, our Jewish identities, our respect in one another, and our desire to tackle the problems of our world. On this Yom Kippur, let us atone for the times when we did not listen to each other and the times when we did not open ourselves to hearing other perspectives and narratives and let us recommit ourselves to our ancient tradition of being courageous, of learning from every person, of finding our values in the Jewish text, of using Judaism as an inspiration for repairing our world and for allowing the divine presence to sit between us. As with the conclusion of Kaddish, let us step back from our positions and bow in respect to those both who sit on our left and those who sit on the right side of our aisles and say together, O se shalom bim romav, hu ya se shalom, aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael, vim ru, amen. Maker of great peace, make peace upon all of us and upon all of Israel, amen. Gemara hatimah tovah. Thank you.